thank you so much for coming, and welcome to another event at the, of, as part of the forum, um, a very special event for those of you who are lovers of Margaret Atwood, and there are so many of us. <laughs> um, it's, it's a wonderful club to be in. I'm, my name is Pat Quigley. I'm the Interim Director of Education here, and it is my responsibility this morning simply to welcome you here, to tell you to have a wonderful morning, and to give you a couple of instructions about book signing. Yes, Miss Atwood is going to sign books in the theater store afterwards, but there's protocol to make it go smoothly for you and for her as well. If you have more than three books to sign, you book hoarders, you, um, you can do that, but you have to wait till the end of the line. So three books and under, you just line up. If you have more than that and you're determined to have them signed, please go to the end of the line. Also, we're going to be handing out post-it notes, and if you would write first name only in big block letters on the post-it note and put it in the book you wish to have signed, all of this is to make it go smoothly and quickly, um, and so people can get to lunch and get to the play this afternoon. So if you would abide by those very few constricting rules, we'd appreciate it so much. Um, Paul Kennedy, of course, is here today with Margaret Atwood, and he's going to do more of an introduction than I am, but there's no way I could stand here um, and have Margaret Atwood follow me without saying a couple of things about her, um, because I've had the pleasure of introducing her before. She's been here several times at the Stratford Festival, and that's really what I want to thank her for today. Not those, for those 40-odd books she's written of prose, poetry, um, and um, novels, um, but also for all the support she's given to our organization. She has not only been here many times to support us, but she's also tweeted out about the plays that she sees here, and um, she's a contributing member of the Stratford Festival. In other words, she's a big supporter of the arts and, and of the Stratford Festival as part of that package. She also, of course, one of the things I dearly love about her, and this was identified again backstage, <laughs> is she's political and she speaks out. Um, and yes. <laughs> Um, she uses her celebrity status, in quotes, um, to promote very good and worthwhile causes. And as, as a result of that, I think she becomes for all of us not just someone whose books we love and whose books we followed throughout our adult lives, but also someone who we can identify with who can speak for us. Um, certainly that's been my history. She has been part of my world my entire adult life. I began, of course, with Edible Woman and the journals of Susanna Moody, um, and I write up to the Stone Mattress. <laughs> I just want to mention, if you haven't read the Stone Mattress, Nine Wicked Tales, you'd best do that as quickly as possible. I also want to mention that she's having a new book coming out. Um, I love her title, so I don't want to get them wrong. The Heart Goes Last. I believe that's out now or coming out momentarily. And she's also about to embark on a project whereby many authors from around the world are writing Shakespeare's plays as novels. This is a celebration of the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. Um, that always somewhat disturbs me, <laughs> but, but nonetheless, it's a celebration of his death. And um, many authors like Ann Tyler, Joe Nesbo, are writing, are picking a play and writing a novel based on that play. Ms. Atwood has picked The Tempest. Um, and we might think it's because of Prospero, and indeed it might be, but my personal little niggling thought is it's probably because of Caliban. Um, she seems to have an affinity with more monstrous types. <laughs> Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask Paul Kennedy, um, the head of CBC's ideas, or at least the representative of CBC's ideas for all of us, to bring out Miss Atwood to be with you here this morning. Once again, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Pat. Let me begin by saying how delighted I am to be here. Um, this is the second year of a partnership between Ideas and the Stratford Festival, and so far it has been a very fruitful partnership, I think good for both partners. Um, this, not many people know this yet, but this coming season will be the 50th season of Ideas on CBC Radio. Yeah. 
uh, we will be celebrating some of what there is to celebrate in this season by presenting on the radio some of the events that we have collected this summer at the Stratford Festival. This is one of those events. I will be brief because I know you all want to hear Margaret Atwood more than you want to hear me. Uh, Pat spelled out the rules and regulations for the signing in the bookstore after. I'll just sort of give you a roadmap of what uh, this session will be like. Margaret will come out after I've given another brief introduction. Uh, she will talk for approximately 20 minutes and then I'll come back out on stage and moderate a question period. There will by that point be two microphones placed in the aisles down here in the orchestra. And uh, you should probably start lining up fairly quickly because I'm pretty sure we won't have time to get all of the audience questions in. I'll keep my own questions brief and try to move to the microphones as soon as possible. Now it's my task to do something which is really an impossible task and that is to introduce somebody who really does need no introduction. Uh, I first met Margaret Atwood, and I was just talking about this backstage with her, in 1970, when I got an autograph in this book, which was not a long pen autograph. In 1970, that technology did not exist, but it was my first acquaintance with one of this country's finest writers and thinkers and activists. I knew her initially as a poet. This book is called Procedures for Underground. And after that, I, I met her, this was 1970. In 1972, I met her in a book which was very, very important to my life, and that book was called Survival. It was a study of Canadian identity, and in two years later, in 1974, I went off to the University of Edinburgh, where I was foolish enough to write a thesis called The Canadian Identity as a Focus for the Study of the Scots in Canada. Um, <laughs> survival was a crucially important work in my research at that time, it gave me theoretical foundation for everything that I was to do with the rest of the thesis. Our, quote, relationship continued and I began to become a real fan of Margaret Atwood's novels as well as her poetry. And then about, I think it's seven years ago now, I really got to spend some time with her when Ms. Atwood was the Massey lecturer in Canada and she presented a series of lectures called Payback, Debt, the dark side of wealth, and the shadow side, I should say, of wealth. And we toured the country, went going from St. John's, Newfoundland, literally to Vancouver, with those five lectures, which were an astounding, galvanizing point in, in not only this country, but around the world, because magically, as some kind of clairvoyant, Margaret Atwood had figured out that there was going to be a real debt crisis. And it happened absolutely simultaneously with those lectures being first sold as books and then as lectures touring across the country. And I don't think there's ever been such a, I don't even know how to characterize the response, but it, it was a response as though these were not just lectures. This is somebody who had somehow deeply probed the psyche of not only Canada, which she's very well known for doing, but the rest of the world. Interestingly enough that on that tour, which was a couple weeks long, I think, and with stops in five different cities, I don't think Margaret Atwood and I ever had a chance to discuss Shakespeare, and let alone her connection with Shakespeare, which is what she will be doing today here on stage at the Avon Theatre. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Margaret Atwood. I'm always shorter than you think. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to talk to an audience here at the Stratford Festival, just as it's always a pleasure to come to Stratford to attend the plays. I hate to think how long I've been doing both, but here I am again, come back like a bad penny. <laughs> the title of this talk is Shakespeare in My Work, from John Beckwith's Trumpets of Summer to Stone Mattress and Everything in Between. Before I get to the first item, I'll take you back in time. Back, back, back. To the Dark Ages, when there was no internet. <laughs> nor cell phones, nor handheld hair dryers, nor even any pantyhose, and especially not any birth control pills. Back to the 1950s, which took place shortly after the last Ice Age. <laughs> that is when I went to high school, 
It was Leaside High School in Toronto, the very same high school attended by Stephen Harper. <laughs> no wonder he hates the arts. <laughs> There I was already, up on the wall, beaming down, watching his every move. <laughs> he, Barbara McDougall, and I are the only, um, quotes, famous people Leaside High School ever produced. The rest became accountants. <laughs> With the odd dentist. The quite odd dentist. In those days, there was a set curriculum for all five years of all high schools in Ontario. This curriculum featured some things you most likely wouldn't be able to drag the kids through now. Two novels by Thomas Hardy. Really? Good luck with that. <laughs> and a Shakespeare play every year. Over the course of five years, we took Twelfth Night, The Merchant of Venice, Hamlet, Julius Caesar, and Macbeth. We had to memorize speeches and write them out on exams. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, pause. <laughs> memorizing things was dropped in the 60s and 70s as it was thought to be too constricting to the growing mind, but it's been making a comeback and none too soon. Who would not wish to be able to recite in the doctor's waiting room tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow <laughs> creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time? And while watching various unsavory political ads of today, it is always soothing to be able to murmur, Why man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs, made yet more massive by photo ops that we ourselves have paid for, <laughs> unwillingly with our tax, and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some time are masters of the fate, their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Thus shouldst thou vote in yonder next election. <laughs> and spoil thy ballot not, or else thy health care coverage shall scant avail thee, but vanish like the dew. Fie out upon him, for tis a poxy crowd. The reek thereof offends the nose of Zeus. I could go on like this for hours. <laughs> Once caught in the riptide of iambic pentameter, it's hard to stop. <laughs> when the Stratford Festival was in its infancy, there was another Shakespearean theatrical enterprise going forward in Toronto, the Earl Grey Players, a small troupe of English actors who had come to Canada in the 1940s when the arts were not exactly a national priority unlike today. <laughs> this troupe heroically began acting the words of the works of the Bard in the Trinity College Quad in Toronto. They did the Tempest. There was a thunderstorm. <laughs> you can't make it up. By the time I made their acquaintance, the Earl Grey players were performing in many Ontario high schools. They would do the play that was on the grade 13 cur curriculum that year, which guaranteed them an audience of nail-biting students. If you were theatrically inclined, you could be an extra, but you had to bring your own costume. A plaid throw rug for Macbeth, a bed sheet for Julius Caesar. Then you'd be taught how to imitate a crowd by saying, rabble, 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 rabble. For most of us, this was our first experience of Shakespeare off the page. And lucky we were to have it, though of course we made fun of it at the time. We put on skits in which Hamlet became omelet and <laughs> offered one another eye of newt sandwiches and spoke of the three wired sisters and 
other such pleasantries typical of the youthful mind at play. We were not the only ones to have our way with Shakespeare. The popular comedy duo of the 50s and 60s, Wayne and Schuster, did a takeoff of Julius Caesar that gave us the immortal exchange. Bartender, a Martinez. <laughs> you mean martini. If I'd wanted to, I'd have asked for them. <laughs> Who remembers that? Yeah, I want you. So you probably all re also remember, Julie, Julie, don't go. <laughs> The Earl Grey players in Shakespeare made their first appearance in writing by me in 1964. The noted composer John Beckwith had got a commission to write a piece for the quatrocentenary of Shakespeare's birth. My former teacher, the poet Jay McPherson, suggested that I write the libretto, possibly because I had a certain amount of libretto writing under my belt already, although it was for satirical college musicals. I actually got paid for doing this, what a thrill, for a 23-year-old who considered herself a writer. The result was a suite of six parts, each one examining interactions between enactments of Shakespeare and the audiences of the times, including an opening night at Stratford and a high school performance. I quote from the University of Guelph's webpage, which knows more about this, than I myself can remember. Atwood's section on the high school play explores theatrical experiences and their relation to education. Atwood takes the point of view of a group of teenagers sitting in the audience, sarcastic and heckling. Now, where did I get that? <laughs> Yet she also shows the educational and cultural benefits of the theater for school-aged children. Atwood's portray portrayal of the theatrical education of school children is a rare illustration of adaptation at work in describing the actual experience of the theater for youth, a kind of meta-theatrical commentary that moves the experience of Shakespeare from the professional stage into other venues where other forms of meaning get made. Thank you, University of Guelph website. <laughs> the players are, of course, the Earl Grey players, and of course I had to put them into a novel sooner or later. There they are in Cat's Eye, 1989, Chapter 44. But the players are doing Macbeth rather than the Trumpets of Summer's Julius Caesar because it suited my plot better. This year the play is Macbeth. Cordelia is a serving woman and also a soldier in the final battle scene. This time she has to bring a plaid car rug from home. She's lucky because she also has a kilt, an old one of Purdy's from when she went to her girl's private school. In addition to her parts, Cordelia is the props assistant. She's in charge of tidying up the props after each performance, setting them in order, always the same order, so that the actors can grab them backstage and run on without a moment's thought. At the end of the play, Macbeth's head gets cut off, and Macduff has to bring it onto the stage. The head is a cabbage wrapped up in a white tea towel. Macduff throws it onto the stage where it hits with an impressive flesh and bone thud. Or this is what has happened in rehearsal. <laughs> but the night before the first performance, there are to be three, Cordelia notices that the cabbage is going bad. <laughs> it's getting soft and squishy and smells like sauerkraut. She replaces it with a brand new cabbage. The play is put on in the school auditorium where the school assemblies are and the choir practice. Opening night is packed. Things go without mishap, apart from the sniggers in the wrong places and the anonymous voice that says, Go on, do it, when Macbeth is hesitating outside Duncan's chamber. <laughs> and the cat calls and whistles from the back of the auditorium when Lady Macbeth appears in her nightgown. I watch for Cordelia in the battle scene, and there she is, running across backstage in her kilt with a wooden sword, her car rug thrown over her shoulder. But when Macduff comes in at the end and tosses down the cabbage in the tea towel, 
it doesn't hit once and lie still. <laughs> it bounces, bumpity bump, <laughs> right across the stage like a rubber ball and falls off the edge. This dampens the tragic effect. <laughs> and the curtain comes down on laughter. It's Cordelia's fault for replacing the cabbage. She is mortified. It was supposed to be rotten, she wails backstage, where I've gone to congratulate her. So now they tell me. This really happened, though in a much later production at Hart House U of T. I make so little up. <laughs> in the 19s and 10s, Shakespeare makes a couple of short appearances in my mini works. There's a piece called Gertrude Talks Back, in which poor Gertrude gets to reply to Hamlet's scolding of her in the famous look on this picture scene. And Horatio gets her prolonged afterlife in a piece called Horatio's Version. These are to be found in the collections Good Bones and The Tent. After that, there's a Shakespeare pause as I was wandering around in the fictional future. But Shakespeare comes roaring back in the recent story collection, Stone Mattress, 2014. The story is Revenant. The central character is Gavin, once a dashing young poet in the 60s, now a crabby elderly one, married to his much younger third wife, Reynolds. At this point, I have to say that I love Richard III as a character. I named the villain in The Blind Assassin after him. Like all tricksters, Richard is too clever for his own good, as indeed is Gavin. I love Gavin too. He's unpleasant, but he's still alive and kicking and raging against the dying of the light. And as John Keats remarked, Shakespeare got as much pleasure from creating an Iago, a very bad person, as he did from creating an Imogen, a very good person. And so do I. People who object to works of literature because the characters in them are not nice have entirely missed the point. <laughs> you know that because you're here. <laughs> Here are Gavin and Reynolds going to a production of Richard III, an outdoor production in a park. Reynolds with optimism and practicality, Gavin with grumpiness. The play was like starting, some spasm in the lighting system, they were told. The mosquitoes were gathering, Gavin swatted at them, Reynolds produced the deep woods off. Some fool in a scarlet unitard and pig's ears blew a trumpet to get them all to shut up. And after a minor explosion and a figure in a rough sprinting off in the direction of the refreshment kiosk, what had they forgotten? The play began. There was a prelude showing a film clip of Richard III's skeleton being dug up from underneath a parking lot, an event that had in fact taken place. Gavin saw it on the television news. It was Richard, all right, complete with DNA evidence and many injuries to the skull. The prelude was projected onto a piece of white fabric that looked like a bed sheet and probably was one. Arts budgets being what they were, as Gavin commented to Reynolds sotto voce. Reynolds dug him with her elbow. Your voice is louder than you think, she whispered. The soundtrack led them to understand, over a crackling loudspeaker and in lousy iambic pentameter Elizabethan pastiche, that the entire drama they were about to see was unfolding post-mortem from inside Richard's battered skull. Zoom to a hole in the skull and then right on through it to the inside of the cranium and blackout. Whereupon the bedsheet was whisked away and there was Richard in the floodlights all set, set to caper and posture, to flounce and denounce. On his back was a preposterously large hump decorated in a jester's red and yellow stripes. The largeness of the hump was deliberate. The inner core of the play, as opposed to the outer core, Gavin had snorted to himself, while reading the program notes, was all about the props. These were symbols of Richard's unconscious, which accounted for their enlargement. 
The director's thinking must have been that if the audience members were staring at outsized thrones and humps and whatnot and wondering what the fuck they were doing in this play, it wouldn't bother them so much that they couldn't hear the words. <laughs> I've never seen exactly that production, but if it were on offer, I'd go like a shot. <laughs> By coincidence, Richard III was the first play the Stratford Festival ever put on. In 1953, directed by Tyrone Guthrie with Alec Guinness in the title role. Woo! <laughs> How I wish I'd been at it, but alas, I was only 13. It took place in a giant canvas tent, a step up from the show Gavin and Reynolds are watching, but not a very large step. Better actors, however. Graham Gibson's grandfather, plus Graham Gibson, were in that canvas tent when they did Othello with Douglas Campbell and Francis Highland. The grandfather by that time was about 94 and he was quite deaf. And uh, just as Othello was tiptoeing across the floor in strangling position, all set to strangle, Graham's grandfather said in what he thought was a low voice, this is where he does her in. <laughs> Pause in the strangling. <laughs> Being professional actors, they then carried on. <laughs> so you now know where I got Richard's too loud voice. I make so little up. I have one more Shakespeare-related piece of writing in the works. It's for the Hogarth Press Shakespeare Project, for which a number of writers from various countries have been asked to choose a play of Shakespeare's and revisit it in the form of prose fiction. For instance, murder writer Joe Nesbo is doing Macbeth and Jeanette Winterson is doing The Winter's Tale. The play I've selected is The Tempest. Wouldn't you know that a Canadian would have to pick something with weather in it? <laughs> I am busily at work on it even as we speak. Here's a hint. The play is about illusions, as we know, and it's about vengeance versus mercy, like so many moments in Shakespeare. But it's also about prisons. So there you have it, Shakespeare in my work. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I think there's probably a graduate student somewhere taking notes on a thesis about Margaret Atwood and her relationship with Shakespeare. You've presented a perfect outline for that person right now. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to help out, you know, it's a helping, helping cottage industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first question I'll ask you, and I will go as quickly as possible for questions from the floor. I think they're setting up the microphones even as we speak. Um, W.H. Auden said that we live in the world he made. And he was talking about Shakespeare as sort of a pivotal person, the tipping point person, it, if not only in English literature, perhaps in all of literature. You're a writer. Do you feel any of that pressure or whatever? Do you feel that, that Shakespeare is something that everyone since him has had to respond to? I think there's little doubt of that, yeah. Um, so, I mean, you always get these questions, who's your favorite writer, blah, blah, blah. And it's a bit lazy, but I do always say Shakespeare. You have to go there if you're a writer in English. No, I you was can also get this nifty book. You can get one at, at Fanfare Books. In fact, I just got one again. I've given several away. I think it's called something like Shakespearean Insults. <laughs> and you can, <laughs> they've got the nouns, the adjectives, the adverbs, and you can sort of flip the pages and make up your own insults using <laughs> insults that he invented. And they've also got notation, like common at the time, he made it up, um, only one use of it, etc. He's very inventive with insults because he doesn't fall back on just standardized swearing. 
And you know those plays were censored. You weren't allowed to swear religiously. Right. So the things he puts together are really uh, pretty impressive. Is that intimidating? When what? You, intimidating. Yeah, when, when, you, when you come up against somebody who can, after he died, 400 years after he died, can produce a book of insults that you've given away <laughs> how many times? I mean, obviously that's a compliment to him, but, but does it mean that you, when you sit down to write something, like the book on the Tempest you're working on now, are you in any way afraid of what you have to do just to confront what he did? What is this afraid you speak of? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it, let I me guess. put it this way um, I don't drive and you're all lucky but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> when one of my um, earlier boyfriends uh, tried to teach me how to drive he gave up after about two times he said you have no fear you know, I wow. can't teach you to drive you have no fear so I do have some fear you know I'm not reckless <laughs> and you don't make anything up. Uh, I make up little, but I do make up some things. So if not intimidating, is it inspirational? Oh yeah, it's very inspirational. Um, so seeing how he puts things together, um, and, and I think if you, if you look at late Shakespeare, you see him taking a lot of the themes that he had and tragically earlier and basically rerunning the film backwards and having them come out okay. We could go into that. Let's do um, it. I mean, what I'm, I'm, you're, you're uh, believe it or not, a fairly funny person. Um, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you get that now? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, just looking at Shakespeare, do you like the comedies more than the tragedies, or do the histories come in there at all? You're also a political no, person. No, I like them all. You like them all? Yeah, with, with I no like differentiation? them all. The, the interesting thing about all of his plays, well, there's a lot of interesting things about them. One <laughs> of them was that he, he, was a, he was an entrepreneurial business guy. You know, he was, he was uh, like an early inventor on the internet. So this new thing had come along, which was um, plays in a theater with a permanent location. The, the Globe, I think, was the first. Uh, and you put your penny in the box. That's where we get box office. Uh, plus, you know, to get in. And plus, it was all classes, whereas, whereas French theater was court theater, which is why it's always about these aristocrats and measured uh, language and no vulgar people and uh, swearing and stuff like that. Uh, whereas Shakespeare was playing to all classes. So there's always a drunken lout or some equivalent, some kind of fool, uh, because the groundlings loved that. They just loved it. Hooray, hooray, they could hardly wait. Um, so you get all classes. But the other thing is where he made his money was the history plays. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the ones that we now think of as the standouts. You know, it wasn't Hamlet. It was the English history plays because that was the first time English people got to see their own history. Um, you could you could get a sort of you could get a tour of Westminster Abbey and see tombs of the kings and get little lectures on them, but having it all laid out in front of you that was the first time. And uh, so they were, and since they'd just been through hell uh, over two hundred years of wars of the roses and internecine intermurderings and uh, dynastic horror and uh, Ma bloody Mary and uh, all of that. They were really interested in it, you know, what just happened. So he was laying it out. I wonder if those plays as well intrigue you because I said you're a funny person. You're also a very political person. And well, Shakespeare not was really. writing. Yeah, I'm not actually a really political person. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't have party affiliations. Um, I'm a promiscuous voter, you know, I voted <laughs> for everybody. I voted for Diefenbaker, if you can imagine such a thing, but I did. I actually joined the Progressive Conservative Party when they were having their leadership convention so I could vote for Mr. Orchard, uh, who got thrown onto the trash heap. So, you know, it's not the name of the party that interests me, it's what they're actually doing. And like a lot of Canadians, I'm, I'm interested in the, the middle range and things being fair. 
So I don't know whether that's political or not, but I'm, I'm not a backroom operative in any way. And I would think Shakespeare had a, a somewhat similar position. I mean, he, I think he was trying to keep him, keep himself from being beheaded quite a lot of the time. Yeah, and, and that <laughs> happened a little more frequently yeah, then than now. To try to, <laughs> you had to tread a fine line. And I don't think he ever really got into bad trouble. Ben, ben Johnson did. Uh, he got hauled in front of tribunals and tut, 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 and finger wag, because he was much more of an immediate social satirist, whereas Shakespeare was doing, quotes, human nature. And, uh, or that, that was his excuse. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we go to questions from the floor, I want to ask a few questions about the Tempest that, that you spoke about. I'm not giving anything away. Oh, well, then maybe I don't have any questions Go to ahead. ask. But. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read somewhere that you're planning on setting it in the Canadian far north. Is that true? No, that, that was a misapprehension on the path of an interviewer, the, on the part of the interviewer. I said, wouldn't it be interesting to set it in the far north? Oh, it, but in it, fact, it, there has been a tempest set in the north. Do tell. I can't remember the exact one, but it's been done. In fact, when you look at the performance history of these plays, it's hard to think of anything that hasn't been done, right. one at some time or another. Uh, the Tempest got turned into basically a musical in the 18th century. They added on a bunch, they put in other characters, there's a lot more singing and dancing. Uh, it, weird. But it was very popular in that form. Hmm. You've so done it's, a lot of it's, it's, you know, people have done Shakespeare every possible just about every possible thing you, thing you can think of. There's even one in which Caliban does get to rape Miranda. Who knew that? It was Peter Brooks, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that intrigues me just because Pat said at the very beginning of this hour that she thought that maybe people would think you're interested in Tempest because of Prospero and the love of books and, and magic that comes from words. Uh, but she wondered whether Caliban might not be the character you're more interested in. All of those characters are, are interesting. Every character um, in the play. Just about, yeah. yeah. There's some really interesting things about every single one of them, except possibly the King of Naples is kind of a void. But, uh, <laughs> but, but everybody else um, is pretty fascinating. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of unanswered questions, like where did Ariel come from? Mm -hmm. Was he already on the island? Did he come with Sycorax? How, what, how was that? Who was Caliban's daddy? Hmm. You believe that devil story? <laughs> There's lots of questions, and A I'm sure you'll have questions. answers for them. In the, yeah, in the and book. what happens after the end? That's, those are interesting questions. Oh, so there'll be a postscript? Oh, I'm not telling. But, but, <laughs> but people, people have addressed themselves to those questions. They've, they've really delved into it quite a lot. Okay, one last question, and then we'll go to questions from the floor. So if people wanted to start lining up at the microphones. You've probably seen a lot of productions of The Tempest. A number, I've, and, and on film as well. So I've seen the one in which Prospero is Prospera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Helen Mirren plays it. It's pretty jolly good, I, I have to that. say. I haven't seen but, it, but it but sounds again, amazing. But again, they had to rewrite the beginning, of course. Uh, and a number of things about the dialogue, but people have been doing this forever with Shakespeare. And so sometimes I get questions from young people, what do you think of fan fiction? So fan fiction is very, very old. Uh, it's at least as old as the Iliad and the Odyssey and everything in between, and there's been a huge amount of fan fiction written um, about Shakespeare. How how can you resist when you're writing what assumes will be an almost completely prose version of a play that has a lot of poetry in it and a lot of amazing poetry in yes, it? Yes, that's true. How can you resist not quoting the play when you're Well, writing? this says I'm going to resist <laughs> Okay. <it. laughs> Finally, I got something out of you about this. <laughs> or maybe I didn't, but that's, that yeah, sounded like did, a confession you that you might. Yeah. Uh, Full nothing. Fathom 5, will that ever appear? Oh, I can't answer specific questions like that. <laughs> okay. okay, well, maybe if yeah. there are people in the audience, uh, go to this microphone. And please, uh, just because we don't have a lot of time, if you can make sure your questions are brief uh, so that there'll be time to feed in more, other, more questions. Maybe so. Ariel is an alien from outer space. Did you ever think about that? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Oh, is it going? Okay. Uh, sorry. 
Um, so I'm not here researching you specifically, but I and, am. And, and why not? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm almost dead, you know. It's a <laughs> fair game. <laughs> Aren't I the one asking the question, though? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I am here in Stratford specifically asking what is Canadian about Shakespeare, and um, I wanted to get your thought on that. Like, as someone so interested in Canadian identity, how can Stratford, which is centered on quote unquote a foreign national, be so at the heart of Canadian like dramatic culture? Okay, let, let's do this rhetorically. Okay. Um, Shakespeare was writing about human beings and human nature. Yes, that is often the Canadians response. are human beings <laughs> <laughs> with human nature. <laughs> Therefore, how can it not be? <laughs> well, I do have a response. It would be that, like, that answer often would ally the differences between people that often are important to those people. And what? so... That, that implies differences between people that are important to people. Yes, yeah, it, that's true. And, and, and you can, you know, doing Shakespeare in canoes in the far north, I mean, you can do that. Uh, you, you can do, as I say, Shakespeare has done just about any possible way you can think of. Uh, I saw an indigenous production of Macbeth in which the, uh, there were warring tribes. And uh, Mac Macbeth does in the head of his tribe, takes his place. I mean, and it was all done, it was all done like that. And uh, there's nothing against that, and it has been done. So I think people, like w with any, uh, we're, we're back to the fan fiction uh, subject, with any uh, great writer, a number of different interpretations are possible and people make that writer their own. Did you, do you remember um, that film called The Postman? The film called The Postman in which a guy has basically lifted a poem and used it to woo somebody and he says, um, Poetry does not belong to the person who wrote it. Poetry belongs to the person who loves it. Mm. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Is there somebody at the microphone again? Oh, that's Pat. Okay, so they ah, okay. all lined up over, over here. here. Okay. Okay, I guess this is going to be the mic then. Um, and and so I can see you up there if you want to yell things from up there. <laughs> Um, so earlier you said that um, is some of Shakespeare's older plays are sort of a reversal of some of the, the earlier the later plays. plays yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. So is The Tempest one of these, and what would be its partner play? Its partner play would be Hamlet. Okay. Which one was written earlier? Oh, Hamlet. All right. Can you sort of go into how those are a reversal? Okay. Let's talk about uh, revenge. Um, another, another of its earlier ones is Titus Andronicus, which is all about revenge. So Prospero has everybody under his control. He gets them all around, all the people who have done him wrong, he gets them all under his control. He could have just blotted them out. It's within his power to blot them out, but he doesn't do that. What does he do instead? He forgives them. Doesn't happen in Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> does not happen in Titus Andronicus. <laughs> Prospero does not bake these people into a pie. <laughs> and there's possible downside to that too. Because although the king of Naples says, gosh, I'm really sorry, bad brother Antonio never says a word after he has been forgiven. He says nothing. It's like Othello when, when they say to Iago, why did you do it? He doesn't say anything. That's why Shakespeare is so terrific. Uh, a lesser person might have, well, I did it because, long speech. You have to try to figure out why he did it. He's always leaving moments when you have to try to figure it out. Do you see that as a progression of Shakespeare as he matured, or do you think that was Well, sort of the thing about Shakespeare, part? which is so wonderful, is that nobody knows much about him at all. He has a great big uh, screen on which people project their own stuff. So I really honestly have no idea. It might have been just the artist in him thinking, well, I've done revenge. 
you know, let's try doing this a different way. Do you often try to interpret Shakespeare as a person or just no. leave it open? He's open. He is very open. I'm, 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 it's the plays. The play's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But of course, I was educated in new criticism, and that's what we, we do tend to do. But, <laughs> but there, there is not much material with Shakespeare. You know, we just don't know that much. He, he didn't keep a diary. He didn't even have any plans to publish his own plays. Other people did that after he died. Is there someone at this bike? No, I can't really see. No? Okay. This is the place to be. Um, as a high school English teacher, um, I teach a lot of Shakespeare. But in addition, I also teach the Odyssey. And as a companion piece, I always use the Penelope ad. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so I sell a lot of your books. Uh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I thanked you. <laughs> There'll be some in the bookstore for sale as well. So. <laughs> um, the I, I was very attentive to the text and yeah. to the uh, non-Odyssey Homeric uh, sources. So I didn't put anything in there for which there isn't a source. I noticed that you um, made a note that Robert Graves was very influential in the research that you did. For he was helpful. Book because yes. he's got all the sources listed for everything. Um, the wit and the humor are wonderful, particularly the, um, the formation of the book and that you have the, um, the chorus. Which the maids. Yes. Yeah. The, well, the, the, that's what appalled me when I first read the Odyssey, so that stuck with me. And I first read the Odyssey in high school um, because, of course, I was taking Latin. In those days, one did and could. In fact, one had to have it to go into honors English. And in order to deal with the Aeneid, you had to know the backstory. So the Odyssey and the Iliad were the backstory. Um, I love the fact that you give the power to the women in the Penelope ad. Well, they don't have exactly power, but they have um, stuff to say. Mm -hmm. it, it, it does take place in the underworld, so basically they're all dead. Uh, so <laughs> so they, have, they have things to say. And what, what people tend to forget about that, that, those family arrangements is that uh, Clytemnestra, Helen, and Penelope are all cousins. So um, that's interesting, and I certainly put that in. And they, they were used that way throughout uh, classical antiquity and, and in medieval times. So Penelope, the good wife, mm -hmm. uh, Helen, the bad wife, and Clytemnestra, the really bad wife, <laughs> <laughs> kills her husband in the bath. <laughs> it's sort of like psycho, only, <laughs> only with the bathtub. <laughs> Don't go in there. <laughs> it's a wonderful book to bring the women to the forefront uh, in the class because it is such a, the Odyssey is such a testosterone-laden book. Well, yes, but it cuts back and forth. It's, one, it's like a model for an early Western movie in which we have Penelope holding the fort and doing mm -hmm. way too much crying, so I had to cut back on that. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't cry as much in my book as she does in the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. But it had to be her running things because there was nobody else. The, Mother-in-law and dad is dead. The father-in-law has gone off to the other side of the island to, to plant pear trees for some reason. And uh, <laughs> she's left holding the castle. And there isn't, there isn't actually anybody else in a position to run stuff. And, and that's not out of step with that period of history either. So meanwhile, so is she about to give in? Uh, is the fort about to fall? But little does she know, the cavalry is riding to the rescue. So it cuts back and forth that way in a very, in a very clever manner. And miraculously, help arrives just as, a, just as she's about to cave. Um, but it's my contention that there's no way she couldn't have recognized Odysseus because mm -hmm. of yes. those short legs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for making the Odyssey so much easier to teach. Um, well, you're very <laughs> for welcome. For giving wonderful breaks to students who can see the other side. 
Thank you. Good. Thank you. Hi. I'm now a year out of high school, and in grade 12, the two works we focused on for the majority of two semesters were Hamlet and Oryx and Crake. Ooh, what a yeah. pairing. Yeah, I, I found uh, <laughs> Oryx and Crake was almost the antithesis of Hamlet, wherein Hamlet the characters they're both have... Pretty, they're both yeah. pretty depressed, those guys. <laughs> sure. <laughs> But Hamlet, uh, the characters often have very complex inner lives, all of them do. The metaphors are less obvious, which could be a factor of uh, language, but uh, I found Oryx and Craig really only had one interpretation to it, and I'd like to know why you made that choice. What is the interpretation that you have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, with most of the metaphors, most of the ideas, the idea is that uh, the arts are important, with certain metaphors like... Um, uh, Jimmy's girlfriend who uh, creates the art where vultures eat different words made out of meat. Uh, that seems to talk about the destruction of love. Um, and so uh, it felt like That's a lot of it That's the theme? Was, um, no. <laughs> no. Okay. I'm not entirely sure what the theme of the book was. It actually kind of confused me. I felt like it was mostly plot driven, so I was confused as to why we were studying it. I'd like to know what your interpretation of the book is, what you meant it to be about, because it didn't feel like it had much substance there. Oh, well, sorry. Guess I failed. <laughs> <laughs> Have another read. It's actually about Hamlet. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, I respectfully disagree. <laughs> um, you talked about Gavin in The Stone Mattress. Um, I, uh, I realized when I read it that both he and the, um, the protagonist in The Blind Assassin were both completely uninterested in academics that were writing about their books, and uh, Gavin especially was extremely unhappy to be forced to speak with a graduate student. And um, I was wondering if, if that was how you felt yourself, or if that's been, <laughs> if they're at it. <laughs> if their attitudes have sort of been influenced by bad experiences with graduate students or anything no, like no, that. No. <laughs> I'm, Iris in um, The Blind Assassin has something to hide. That's mm. why she doesn't want to speak with them. Gavin is actually pretty riveted by them, uh, but he gets very upset when he finds out that he is not the subject of the inquiry. So, so he, he likes to show off, of course, uh, and, to, and to tease. But when he finds out that that this girl is, is actually more interested in his partner of those times. He's really quite apoplectic. <laughs> uh, so then he feels, you know, quite betrayed that this pe person has been led into the house not to talk about him, capital H, but about her. He resents that deeply. Uh, so no, it has nothing to do with, with um, my attitude towards graduate students. They are, unfortunately, somewhat easy to make fun of. Uh, <laughs> but I've, I've, I've been one myself, so I know that. You know, and I, I, know how, I know what the problems are that they face, which is all of these things have, quotes already been done. So you're forced into a more and more recondite subject for your thesis. And, and some of them are actually very good. They, they, they send them along, and I think they're pretty insightful. But the, the lengths that you have to go to to find some, something that's going to be acceptable to the, uh, to the minders, uh, it can be quite scary. And, and those who have been through it all, all say the following thing. You, you get reduced to about grade one. I mean, and your, your feeling about yourself is that you're really, you've kind of shrunk. Uh, so it is an ordeal, and I sympathize. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> um, I was wondering, and I apologize if this question is too broad, but if you find that if our national sort of consciousness or theme is about like survival, if that influences our approach to Shakespeare and if it gives a specific context to it as Canadians or even just personally for yourself. Oh, well, my book, Survival, was about what Canadians write, uh, not about what they study. Uh, so Canadians study all kinds of things. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question because I don't quite see how those two things come together, but um, obviously any Canadian studying Shakespeare is a Canadian, but what does that mean? 
and survival also, I have to say, was written in 1972. And although some of those things are still true, and some of the things that are predicted in that book have come true, other things have changed quite a lot. Uh, so what can I what can I tell you? Um, not not much okay. about that. Right, thank you. I've been given a five minute call, and so I think there's oh there's three questions here. If we can fit three questions in, that will be the end of the morning. So. All right. My question is, um, in light of your reworking the Tempest, so to speak, into novel form, do you find any parallels between the character of Prospero and uh, famous artistic personalities such as yourself? <laughs> what? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I get it. I think I get it. Um, but I'm not sure how to answer it. I mean, w one of the things he's interested in is his, is his um, magic abilities. But what he understood by those magic abilities probably encompasses quite a lot more about chemistry and, and physics and um, that kind of thing than, than, than writing. He's, he's not a writer, Prospero, in the play. A lot of people see him as a... Um, as a voice of Shakespeare, but since we don't know anything about Shakespeare, it's really hard to, to say. Uh, but I would say that anybody who's creating anything, and there is a big synthesis going on right now between the arts and the sciences. Um, people are constantly, and, and this never would have happened in, in 1970, people are constantly asking me to talk about the relation between the arts and the sciences or between the humanities and, and the sciences. And a lot of artists are doing projects that incorporate both. I don't know whether you saw the Future Library project uh, in which um, writers for the next hundred years, one a year, are writing a manuscript that they will deposit in Norway and none of those will be opened until year 100. The artist who thought that up is Katie Patterson, who works with scientists all the time on her projects. For instance, she's got something called the space candle, which as, you, as it burns down, makes the smells of different planets. She said, unfortunately, <laughs> some of those smells aren't very nice. And uh, <laughs> they had this on display in a French, um, in a French art gallery, and they put it right beneath the air intake for the air circulation. <laughs> so the whole thing was smelling like Saturn, which is apparently rotten eggs, a lot of sulfur mix. Anyway, she's a very smart, interesting girl of, of age, about 34. And uh, she said, she's got it. She said, you know, I've got this book, and, and it's got, I'm going to put into it uh, 200 of the ideas that I haven't done yet. And I said, Katie, why don't you put in 150? and do the other 50. <laughs> anyway, it was her, it's, it's her project, but she's, she's always bringing together um, a concept that, in, that, that makes it necessary for her to consult scientists to find out the science of her project. That's happening all over the world as far as I can tell now. That which was separated is now coming together again. And so it does with Prospero. What is he essentially but a physicist, weather worker, illusionist? So I'd say open season. Pick any artistic figure, and uh, you can probably make a case. Thank you. My question, um, uh, I can't talk very well, so bear with me. <laughs> um, you're writing currently a more modernized version of, a t of The Tempest, or modernized, depending on how you're approaching it. So that puts you with a baseline plot as a writer to be working with. With your other works that you kind of just fabricate yourself, is that how you begin as well? Like, or how would you go about your beginnings? Okay, as a project, it's more like the Penelope ad, uh, in that, you, you can't change the plot. You know, you can't, a lot, a lot of people have. Um, but we know the story of Odysseus. You can't just have Odysseus killed by the Cyclops in the middle of the book. 
you know that wouldn't wouldn't do so there are certain parameters that you're given but and and it's true that that uh, when you're quotes making it all up yourself you don't have those those strictures but there are certain things about structure that remain true no matter what kind of thing you're writing it's it's actually no different from writing for instance a sonnet which has a set form um, so you're given you're given a number of um, edges if you like and you know that you can't go over those edges and that actually um, it, it doesn't decrease creativity it's it's a little bit like a pressure cooker in which uh, it can in, in fact increase creativity Robert Bringhurst uh, who's written quite a lot about poetic form says that uh, poetic form is like the wings on a bird uh, the the thing won't necessarily fly but without the wings it really won't fly mm. just because it has wings doesn't give you necessarily flight but without the wings there is no flight and so it is with structure in any work of art thank you last question yeah. um, I'm actually um, I'm an English teacher as well um, but I'm also an English teacher of young women I teach at an all-girls school and as a young woman myself, I discovered your works in high school, and they really spoke to me about what it meant to be a woman, a woman and how women treated each other and those kinds of things. So I guess my question for you is if you had one advice, one piece of advice for a young woman today in high school, in college, dealing with a lot of the issues that your books deal with, what would it be? Well, you can't give general pieces of advice. Uh, advice is always to an individual, just as every book is always read just by an individual you know there may be a sum total of those individuals but any person reading a book at any one time is one person so I would have to say what's your problem <laughs> <laughs> which 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 girl uh, what is uppermost in her mind uh, what does she want to be what does she think her challenges are what is blocking her what is encouraging her uh, there isn't just, I mean, you could, you could say, live well and prosper, you know, so <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> uh, which is good advice, you know, live well and prosper, but, but how do you do that? So now, in 2000, of what year is it? 2015, the women, what were they? They were public school teacher, uh, nurse, secretary, um, airline stewardess, that was a hot one right then, right then. and uh, home economist. So for that reason, I, silly old me, when I was offered an extra subject, which could have been art, secretarial sciences, or, or home economics, I took the home economics because being a mercenary child and having parents who went through the, through the Depression, I knew I would be expected to make my own living no matter what else I wanted to do. So I can do your buttonholes, no problem. But I never learned how to touch type. The girls in secretarial sciences were too scary anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Smoked in the washroom, <laughs> very thin eyebrows, <laughs> boyfriend's ankle bracelets. Uh, I'm, I'm also from the age in which they skipped people, so I was 12. You know, this was just too scary for me. Uh, and, and they failed people, so a lot of people in grade nine were, were 15 and a half. They all shaved. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. You know, what, in talking to them, I would have to ask, what are, what are their problems? And a lot of the kids right now, of course, are very worried about what's happening to the planet. We were worried about being blown up with nuclear bombs. You know, different worries, same kind of fear of annihilation. Uh, but it was the age in which people were digging these uh, bomb shelters <laughs> in the bottoms of their gardens. And uh, there was that wonderful satire on it from beyond the fringe, uh, in which they said, uh, I'm here to advise you about what to do in the case of a nuclear explosion. You just uh, pull on this large paper bag over your over your head, and then you just hop along to the nearest uh, uh, aid station, and they will tell you what to do. <laughs> so that's you know different different times. 
different times. We were really scared of communists and being exploded with nuclear bombs, and they're, they're afraid of the whole human race dying because uh, the planet will burn up, etc. Thank you very much. Um, it's my very unpleasant task to end this session. Um, we could go on for a very long time. I want to, in doing that, thank Paul Kennedy and, and the CBC. Um, yay, CBC. <laughs> <laughs> Now take that love back in your heart when you face everything that you face on a daily basis. There are so many out here that love you right across the country. And of course, Margaret Atwood, um, I, you are my Prospero, I have to say. Um, you've created so much magic in my life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.